I guess. <laughs> well, with uh, that. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, they tell you it's like it's a flat thing. You can put the sandwich on it. You can make a nice dish. Hi. Hey. It's Tech Chat Tuesday. We, I don't, I never start the show right. Uh, welcome Isn't to that Tech. Right? That yeah. was the first time I think it came out right. Yeah, Tech chat tuesday hi everybody welcome to tech chat tuesday i'm your uh one of your hosts ken rimple i'm becca rufford and we are glad to be here with you on tuesday april 5th 2022 uh i guess first off we want to bring up the fact that let me share my screen as i never do on time uh -huh. let's just do screen two uh want to bring up that uh we are Chariot Solutions. Um, we have a, oh, oh, you're kidding me. Hold on one moment, everybody. Chrome has lost permission to capture your screen. Didn't we just talk about this? I think we just talked about this yep. literally a minute ago. Is it Chrome profiles? It, well, I have my regular Chrome profile. Hey, everybody, let's talk about how much I hate Chrome. Um, Becca, it's been nice talking to you. I'll be signing off for a minute, and then I'll be back. Uh, okay. Miles, keep everything running. Becca, why don't you tell a story? Okay, I'll do crouton.net. Yeah, go ahead. All right, cool. That works. Bye, Ken. Bye. Okay, so um, one of my favorite little internet gems is a website called crouton.net. Um, it's actually been around since December 7th, 1999, um, and it hasn't changed once since then. So if you pop in crouton.net to your browser, uh, it's essentially just like a five pixel by five pixel PNG of a little animated crouton. Um, and that's it. It's basically just like opening head, opening body, crouton image done. And it hasn't changed since 1999. So um, the beauty I think of crouton.net is that they have the opportunity to stick an ad on this page or um, you know, put some, put some Google ads or something like that because apparently it's, um, let's see. So it's estimated website traffic net worth is $10,138. So someone could easily stick an ad on that page and collect some cash, but they haven't. And I find that to be really beautiful. It's just a non-changing fixed, crouton out there on the website and nobody's pocketing any cash from it or anything it just exists so pop in crouton.net and check out that little crouton yay let me try miles i'm gonna try again share screen uh-huh hi everybody i'm back the host is what he's doing look at that hey but, so you did cr the crouton website still up Making a little bit of cash, Since maybe? December 7th, 1999. Has not changed once. Ah, I love it. All right. Well, so first of all, let's talk about who we are a little tiny bit. Um, I had nice tabs and everything. It was so great. Uh, but I didn't anymore. So we are Chariot Solutions, and we are a consulting firm that does lots of different technologies in the web and oh, back-end application development. We do uh, cloud and all sorts of technologies. Anywho, um, so our website is chariotsolutions.com. Our podcast is available uh, on YouTube. If you go to YouTube slash Chariot Solutions, uh, you can pick our playlist and pick Tech, Tech Chat Tuesday. Um, you can also find all of our stuff over here on the resources tab, uh, including there's the podcast. You can subscribe through RSS and iTunes if you ran into this through a Google search. Uh, and uh, so that's that. We also have a ton of content. Let me go to the YouTube site. What am I doing? YouTube.com. Chariot Solutions. That one, that's what I wanted. If you go to our playlists, um, you see a ton of different playlists, including all of our conferences that we, we've covered uh, and run over the years, Philly Emerging Technologies for the Enterprise. You can watch a super playlist of all of them. You can watch the Philly ETE from last year uh, and a whole bunch of other things. And there's Check Tech, Tech Chat Tuesday. See, I did it again. Uh, right there. Um, anyway, also this week on our blog, we have a, a post by Joey Pistoni. Uh, he was a newer chariot engineer. Uh, why you should be writing your microservices in Go. I know we don't have a lot of Go content, but uh, he has a really good thorough article. I know I worked with him a bit on uh, getting it published. Lots and lots of good details. There's a GitHub repo and it goes through uh, Go, 
building web services with GoKit uh, and uh, a little bit on like the technology behind it. So really this is cool. great. Shout out to Joey because this goes deep. Yeah, it really does. It really does. So, hey, fantastic work, Joey. All right. Uh, let's keep going here. I need my bookmarks. I need my bookmarks. Uh, ETE 2022 is coming up. Uh, we are now in the last month, as I well know, as I'm working on a talk, uh, before ETE hits, uh, our schedule is online. Um, you can register for Philly Emerging Technology to the Enterprise. It's a virtual conference, April 19th to 20th. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, all day, two days, there's three tracks, or I should say three simultaneous talks at least. Uh, and we try to make sure they're separated nicely so that we don't have a lot of overlap. So areas of technology, um, we try to kind of break it up so that we've got a plenty of uh, good things in the mix at the same time. You'll see the schedule online. There's lots of really good stuff here. We've got, you know, uh, AI, we've got uh, machine learning, uh, component library design, observability, you name it. Uh, lots of stuff on things like Java, the rock programming language, a um, whole bunch of stuff. If you use the code TechChat, all one word, capitalized, uh, in your registration, you will save 25 bucks. So you can save some money. It's not an expensive conference at all. Mm -hmm. And if you register for the conference, you get access to the talks as soon as they're published online before you put them out to YouTube later uh, in early summer. So it's really worthwhile spending a little bit of money uh, to get a lot of really good things. Just to cover some of the really cool things we're, we're going to have in this, we have two keynotes. Uh, Elizabeth Adams is talking about um, the uh, leadership of responsible AI. She's our first keynote at the beginning of the conference. Uh, so discussing things like uh, how AI um, has issues with, you know, detecting people with different, you know, uh, like uh, ethnicities. And so that's a big issue because, you know, it may not be programmed in all cases properly. So there's a really good talk that she has about, like, what does it look like to be a responsible uh, rollout of AI? Mm -hmm. uh, then again, we have all of our uh, other talks. The keynote at the end of the conference is Cory Doctorow. He's a futurist, uh, science fiction author, activist, and journalist. He's really interesting. He's been on This Week in Tech and a number of other things. He's an Electronic Frontier Foundation member. Just really cool stuff. So again, use tech chat, all one word for your registration code for that. And we use Slack too as discussion for the conference. So I actually just set that up this week. Um, all the attendees will be getting that information shortly. But one of the beautiful things about Slack is it kind of provides a place for those like serendipitous interactions that you might have like in the hallway at a conference. Um, like last year, our keynote, Alan Kay, hung around for like an hour after his talk to talk to Richard Feldman about like typed languages. Um, so you really get a chance to like interact with these speakers and have one off conversations with them. Yeah, really, really good. And it's been very interactive each year. For the last two years, we've been stuck in COVIDville. Um, it's been nice to have that place to talk. So yeah. absolutely. And hats off to you for running that. You do a great job. Well, thanks, Ken. All right. So let's do it. Let's get into the news items. First up, we have React 18 landing. Uh, React 18 has been in like beta and then in release candidate phase for a long time, a couple months. And uh, so now it's live. And there are a number of things I've been tracking. I, I like mind mapping personally. So I've been going crazy on this. Um, I use a tool called MindNode and just kind of tracking a whole bunch of stuff, which I will not be covering in this talk. <laughs> but, you know, just as a quick capsule, um, they're making major improvements. So for example, one of the things that they've had a hard time with was how to update React uh, components as data is being changed. Um, before React 18, you had one update on one render that can happen at a time um, and one change that could happen per render. So like it's, it's, it's getting its change together, it's doing the render and you can't cancel it. The biggest thing now is that it's gonna batch changes together and renderers will be asynchronous. So it really speeds up any kind of updates that are coming in. In addition to that, there are concepts like start transition, which is you have a component that's being loaded asynchronously and you could say, well, I'm gonna kick this off as a transition. And while I'm waiting for that to load, I can use a suspense component, which wraps around it. And it says, well, I'm loading, show this spinner or what have you. And that way you can kind of put these at different levels in your application, wherever it makes sense. Uh, and you can handle like asynchronous loading and make it much more smooth. The other thing is, as it's doing the rendering and as it's batching things together, it's trying to do that 
off the main thread as much as possible. So you're getting much more interaction for things like type of head boxes and things like that. You'll have a lot more, um, less blocking time taken up. So those are some of the big things that, that have changed. They're working on a number of other features uh, like uh, server side components, uh, which is in preview. Um, and so, and they have a, a, a new renderer that you have to mount. So this is something where if you go to React 18, read the docs and how to upgrade. There's a really nice article on there. Uh, one of the biggest things you have to do is you have to switch the rendering uh, of the initial component uh, to use a function called create root. And that enables all the async renderer, concurrent rendering work, which is really good. And you're getting on React a little bit in your ETE talk, right? Yeah, I'm actually, my ETE talk is about um, Next.js and Remix Run. Okay. Uh, and they both are React-driven frameworks. And they, they are really trying to solve the, how can we quickly do things on the server side and bring them back? Or can we pre-compute them uh, and bring them back quicker uh, than normally or compute them at the edges of the cloud? So they do have a preview of one of these features, React 18 server components, um, but I'm still hacking with that a little bit. It does work, but I'm not sure if I'll have that for the talk. Too much detail because it's still kind of not released. Um, so things are kind of up in the air. But yes, and React 18 is available. You can upgrade things like Remix and you can upgrade things like uh, Next.js to use React 18 as well. Cool. All right, next bookmark. Uh, we are going to the next item. Okay. Here follows a number of little things about Spring Framework's vulnerability. So out in the wild, um, I'll just put this up here real quick. Out in the wild, um, a couple of re technology researchers, and I believe one in China, uh, had discovered a vulnerability with Spring that allows you, if the conditions are exactly right, which you'll see in the outline over here, there's got to be a lot of them, um, it allows you to put a, a piece on your URL, uh, question mark class, and literally interact with the class loader to do things, which means you could run a shell on the server and get things done. So this is something that is patched in Spring Framework version 5.3.18 and 5.2.20. So if you have anything older than those two and 5.3 and 5.2 framework lines, you should consider upgrading uh, and there are, there are, in the articles that I'll point to, there is a filter you can turn on to basically disallow this uh, command line query, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the get query having class in it or some other things that kind of filter this out. Um, but let's look at what the, the, the details are. You have to be running JDK 9, which a lot of companies are doing further than JDK 9 now. So that's not that you, uh, rarefied. You have to be running Tomcat for your servlets. A lot of companies still use Tomcat. One of the things is it has to be packaged as a, a web application archive, not a Spring Boot jar. And I think a lot of more modern Spring Boot applications use Spring Boot and they deploy them as an executable Spring Boot jar. So this kind of is something that kind of keeps it out of the vulnerability list. You have to be using Spring Web MVC or Spring Web Flux. Um, a lot of projects use those. And you have to be in these older versions. Um, Venture Beat. Uh, has a couple of articles that they put out as they were tracking this. So, so Palo Alto uh, Unit 42 is one of the ones that uh, kind of comes up with a very great detail on exactly where this came from. There's a good root cause analysis of this thing where they find out that one of the things that they learned was there was a CVE, a, a, a patch um, for 2010 to Spring Framework to kind of close some of the, the vulnerabilities down for remote execution. But JDK 9 opened up another avenue, which is why this suddenly shows up that people have discovered that that exists. So if you're curious on exactly what caused it and the kinds of evil you can do with it, you can take a look at this. This is a pretty thorough, um, like people are creating a reverse shell connection to remote server to then execute any code they want if all the conditions are right. So this isn't something to panic about, but it's more of a check to make sure if the vulnerability applies to you. Um, there, I believe it's at the end of this. Where is it on here? I'll have to find it and we'll put it in the show notes. The, the actual filter that you can use to like keep it from being a vulnerability on an existing Spring platform while you're getting ready to upgrade. So it's just a configuration change, a uh, small build change that you could do to fix it. Um, so here's the VentureBeat article that basically says, 
It doesn't seem to be log for shell, which is the log for J vulnerability all over again, because it's a smaller group of features uh, that, that lend to it, a, a smaller group of uh, people potentially using it. That said, you should take it somewhat seriously. Here is the, the comment from Will Dorman. The prerequisite, you use spring beans, which most spring people do. Spring parameter binding, not everyone does that. Whoops. Um, it must be configured to use a non-basic parameter type, such as a plain old Java object. That is not what people normally do. So that's one of the things that keep it out of the world. Most, most front-end applications today are things like React and Angular and Vue, communicating with JSON back and forth with RESTful APIs. If you still have a traditional server-side JSP-based app and you decide to use plain old JavaScript objects in, in a, a parameter list, with query strings, this might be you. Uh, and so his comment was, all this smells of how can I make an app that's exploitable as opposed to how can I exploit this thing that exists? Mm -hmm. So I take that, that's a pretty decent uh, potential like view about this. Uh, what else? And um, yeah, that's pretty much everything I have to say about that. So check your Spring applications, make sure you either patched your Spring applications or that uh, you know you, put some mitigation efforts in place, which you can find out there. And I'll, I'll post a link to that. All right, next up, batteries. I will be uh, very transparent and have been on the show. I have a Chevy Bolt, a 2020 Chevy Bolt. That Chevy Bolt has been under recall since almost a year because 18 of the hundred and some thousand Chevy Bolts in the country have burned up. Um, now, compare that to automobiles uh, that are gasoline, where there's like 100 plus thousand of the burn up every year. It's a rare number, but nevertheless, the reason for it is lithium ion battery technology can create spicy pillows, as we talked about. <laughs> That's right. Um, yes, it is safe to do if you go to Reddit and you look up U slash spicy pillows. Um, I hope it's without a dash. Anyway, um, what it will show you is a whole bunch of swelled batteries with hydrogen gas in them because crystals form and they potentially will break down the battery structure and cause basically the battery to, to ultimately fail and maybe expand, blow up. And when lithium hits the air, it catches fire. So is that entire Reddit community just dedicated to photos of that occurring? Well, now that you've said this, hold on. Yeah, you got to bring up spicy yep, pillows yep. now. Let me just make sure I get the right one. <laughs> I think it has a dash. Oh, R spicy pillows. It does not have a dash. This is worth seeing just because it's kind of hilarious. Here is the spicy pillows Reddit. <laughs> Mild um, spice with just a tiny battery. So for example, rip this out of an iPod. Now, there Ooh. is a spicy pillow. Now imagine you have a, a, a car with hundreds of these little batteries in it all put together in a pack on the floor where you're basically your foot is um, all the way to the, to the trunk. And imagine one of them starts to swell. That's the danger. And it's not just the Chevy bolt. It's all, all EVs have some level of potential for this to happen. Mm -hmm. But point being that it's a, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a big deal. Um, <laughs> there's a MacBook <laughs> spicy pillow. It, by the way, this is just a tip, a pro tip. If your MacBook's keyboard starts raising or any computer's keyboard starts raising up above where it was, you may have a spicy pillow. Um, if your phone, back of your phone pops off, do not poke the hole in the battery. <laughs> it will blow up and burn. Yeah, is this spoken from experience? Nope. Uh, <laughs> it, I've had one phone swell like that. I've had a couple laptops like go bad. Um, a little bit spicy. They've all got spicy ratings. The thing is they have to have a decent amount of like strength to those covers, yeah. to those battery uh, pouches. So most cases they're pretty safe. I did hand in one, by the way, Staples, go to Staples. You can freely drop off any electronics to recycle. I gave them a couple of the spicy pills. Said, Here you go. And they're like, no problem. I said, do not poke that. <laughs> and they said, yeah, we know about these things. So, okay. Anyway, no, that's a complete tangent. I'm sorry, everybody, for, for spending time at, my, at your expense for my fun. But uh, one of the problems with, with uh, lithium-ion batteries uh, is that the, the energy density is not so uh, high. So compared to, like, gasoline, it takes a lot more lithium-ion battery uh, power 
to equal what a gasoline tank would have in it. Um, so you're never going to get uh, the, the same uh, efficiency and power from current lithium ion technology. Theon has created this thing. Miles, what did I call it? Where is it? Um, got to get the acronym up. Oh, look, we've got Ronald in the chat said his iPhone battery busted straight through yep. the case. <laughs> Ronald, I totally hear you. And that's exactly what we said. There we go. I, I call this yet another battery technology that may be something or other. Um, uh, whatever. Will be better. So the point is, they have found that the lithium sulfur cathode, so lithium ion batteries have a cathode and an anode, and they've decided and they've determined that if they put sulfur in the cathode, it triples the energy density. Also, here's the big deal, requires 90% less energy to produce this battery. That could be a huge savings, and also sulfur is everywhere, as evidenced by the new quality assurance team for this new company. Sulfur is everywhere. Yep, that's my, that's my quality assurance team for the batteries. They can sniff out sulfur. They can create their own sulfur. But anyway, point being, lithium ion cells have cathode materials that have high processing costs, as they say in the article on whichev.net, and high content levels of metals like nickel and cobalt. But sulfur requires much less energy to produce and is 99% cheaper to source. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. So let's yeah. hope we keep improving battery technology and we start seeing this. I think they said they were going to start looking. Here we go. Uh, they're going to ship this to aerospace customers uh, to qualify them for use in aerospace technology. And then it plans to service air taxis, drones, mobile phones, and laptops, and eventually looking at the electrical vehicle so sector in 2024. Mm -hmm. Also, Elon Musk has been working on battery technology for decades. So... Mm -hmm. We'll have to see if some of this stuff becomes innovations. The only thing I see that I, I scratch my head out and worry about is there are 16 patents pending, which means if everyone creates a custom technology with their own patents, it's going to be proprietary technology. And I don't know, you know, hopefully they'll start licensing it for a reasonable price to battery manufacturers, one would hope. Okay, cool. I found an interesting project called uh, uh, Form Troubleshooter in Google Chrome Labs. So this is something where they're still working on making this a, a, a public extension to actually be available on the Chrome store. Uh, however, you can download it. Uh, they even link to the download somewhere in here. There it is. And you can just download the extension. You go into, let me see here. Uh, this up. Uh, here's a little React app with a form. Uh, you go into your settings, sorry, more tools, extensions, and you run developer mode and you can load an unpacked extension. So you download this extension, you unzip it to a folder, and you click load unpacked and you point to the form troubleshooter and it fires it up for now until you can get it on the extensions. But it's cool. I went and I grabbed just a random. Um, I grabbed a random uh, code sandbox sample of a React form, uh, fired it up, and right away it came up and said, hey, you don't have an input label for these things. Oh. Um, yeah. And then here's some common mistakes, right? Found an element with invalid attributes. It didn't like placeholder. It wanted to see data placeholder, I suppose. Um, and then the form details, here are all the fields and oh, what wow. they have and don't have. Isn't that cool? Yeah. And so this so, tests for accessibility in a sense too. That's mm -hmm. incredible. Isn't that great? So anyway, nice little plugin. Uh, I, I'll take anything that helps me with uh, you know debugging this kind of stuff. Uh, so it's called Form Troubleshooter. It is from Google Chrome Labs. It's an official uh, thing that that team is working on, which is nice. Wow. All right. So nifty, cool thing. All right. Let's go into. I'm in the wrong one. Who's the professional on this show? Becca, you're the professional on this show. I'm not. We are going to go into, let's talk. Uh-oh. Oh, hold music. Okay. Hold music. So the reason I fell down this hole was because I actually re-listened to Amber Case's keynote from ETE 2021. So mm -hmm. Amber Case self-describes as a cyborg anthropologist. And her area of study is this, this thing called calm technology. And so like, the premise of calm technology is that the difference between annoying technology and technology that helps us 
is how it engages our attention. So this is through like notifications, it's through like sounds, beeps, boops, whatever. And she's basically, she's a major consultant to companies who are trying to figure out how to make these notifications, how to like um, create these sounds. So she gives some examples of some good ones and some not so good ones. And in her talk, she talks about, um, she was pulled into a company that she wouldn't name and they were making a smart fridge. And one of the features of the smart fridge was that it would like beep when something was complete or when it reached a certain temperature, something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, she was like, so what about the, the controls on that? Like, can people turn that off? Can they turn the volume down? And they said, no, we, we want people to know when this thing is happening. Uh -huh. She was like, that's the first meeting I ever walked out of, like just walk straight out of, you can't do that. That's, that's like abusive to the customer. Yeah. That's annoying technology basically. Mm -hmm. And so um, she also gave an example of like a really good one. So she spent a lot of time in Japan and she wrote her book while she was there because she felt that their, their culture has a really good handle on this balance. And she gave an example of a rice cooker, which we actually have one here. So when you put in all your rice and you cook it and it's finished, the rice cooker makes like this joyful little tune. It's just like a twinkle, twinkle little star. And it's just, it's so happy. Um, and it's just kind of like your rice is done. It's fluffy. It's perfect. And she was like, that's a, that's a great example of using sound um, to kind of bring an element of delight and joy. And so she made a mention in passing in this talk about hold music. And um, it was literally just a minute or two. And she, she, flashed by it, but it got me thinking about another piece of content that I consumed recently, which was a reply all episode. Um, it's a podcast about like little tech uh, human interest pieces, I guess. And so the one of the hosts of the show is a musician and he was trying to cancel a service for something. It was like a credit card and they put this hold music on and him as a musician, he was like, this is a banger. Like, this is really good. <laughs> and so this is the whole music right here. Is this it? Yeah. Hold on, let me see if I can play it. Oh, man, where, how can I play it? Here we go. And so the other co-host describes it as the theme to the end of a long battle. Like, it's like slow motion in the 70s. And like the, I think the thing that struck me is that the sounds, like even the tone, so he used, I think the, the producer used a Wurlitzer 200 for this, which is just mm. like a nice warm sound. It kind of emulates the sound of a tone on a phone. So yeah. it fits really naturally when you're listening to it versus like, for example, I was on Hold Click Verizon or something the other day and they're blasting, it's like top 40 music, but it sounds like it's coming through the radio of a car that's like driving through the mountains. So it's like, <laughs> coffee, it's like static -y, it's like Taylor Swift barely getting through the, the chaos. Oh. Um, and it's, that's just so ill suited for hold music. Um, and so anyway, part of the reason why they why they called out this simplicity by Macroform is the name of the perfect hold music is because it's so suited for a phone. Um, it's just very pleasant and relaxing to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> I love stuff like this. Uh, I, I'm just going to make a, a little imitation of hold music that I've heard through my entire tech career. Dum 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 and then keyboard do do behind you and you just want to take the phone and break it into tiny pieces and find out where they are and deliver the phone in a box to them say never call me again and everybody used to have this digital hold music they would get from like the vendor you know like here's your hold box and it would just like press this button for an inane piece of music yep oh yep Oracle Tar reports. I remember sitting there for two hours on hold with that stupid song. It'd be crazy. <laughs> it's like and burning into it. your brain at this point. Yeah. yeah and everyone used the same stupid one for a long time. So. And so what Amber was kind of arguing was like, why do we have to make it so painful? Why can't we just choose really simple pieces of music that like this experience, even though it's bad, even though you're on hold and you're already probably mad, they get a little joyful tune going on. I don't know. I'm, I still love like, darn, I still love like the Blues Brothers um, the scene in the Blues Brothers where they're waiting to go upstairs uh, and in, in the elevator and everyone around them, there's SWAT teams and there's tanks and they're trying to get the Blues Brothers and they got that going on. 
So our, I, I said I wasn't going to do it, but see, I'm, I'm too, I'm too vain. Uh, oh, so, so Ken and I recently collaborated on some whole music for the upcoming ETE conference. I actually slacked Ken, like, hey, like, I know you're good at music. Like, do you think you can help me with this? And he's like, actually, I'm sitting in the office right now with my guitar and your drums, right? Yep. No, it was actually, it's a, a drummer in Logic. Oh, cool. Here we go. Here we go. Here's, here's the official hold music for ETE. <laughs> So I figured we wouldn't torture everybody. Well, you just have to come to the show and listen to it while you're That's right. To start. <laughs> anyway, point being, spend a little time on making the whole music less painful for people. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anyway, um, let's see here. What do we got? We and that's pretty much it. I waxed about crouton.net. Actually, if you want to pull that up in the browser so people can actually see crouton.net. Get great. ready, everybody. Crouton.net hasn't changed since 1999. Yep, 1999. The producer saying, for our like, show was born in 1999. The what? Our, our current producer, Miles Rimple, was born in 1999. Miles, this is as old as you. Oh. How cool is, is it? that? It's literally just open head, open body, crouton.png. There it is. That's the entire <laughs> document right there. I'm saying, like, I think this is just so beautiful because like they have the opportunity to throw an ad on this page or something and collect some cash. Like it actually has a valuation of like ten thousand dollars or something like that. But <laughs> everyone wants to have crouton.net. It's just a beautiful little crouton. That's it. The International Crouton Users Group wants to uh, <laughs> <laughs> wants to get serious about their bread topics. Um, all right. Well, we now have a special for you. Uh, we have a great talk uh, coming up from Linda Rising. Uh, she is an agilist and an educator of all things agile techniques and cognitive uh, uh, topics for how people think and how people approach things and how people solve problems. Um, and Linda is just a joy to talk to. She has been in ETE at least two times in the past, um, back in the aughts. I know we brought her out a couple times when she was... Uh, uh, she had, um, what were the books now? Hold on. I, I had everything all nice and set and then I had to restart Chrome. So first of all, here's her website, Linda rising and let's debug it. There we go. Uh, <laughs> so here's our, uh, her website. She wrote, co-wrote a book with another, uh, person called fearless change, which is patterns, uh, like, uh, finding out ways to, uh, change uh, people's perspectives on things and introduce new tech and things like that. So it's patterns based. She was really into the patterns community. So you're in this pre-interview that we did before ETE. And then she introduced another one called More Fearless Change, which is kind of a follow-up book. Um, what we started out with on the interview uh, was we started talking about one of her talks, Thinking Fast and Slow, which was based on uh, this book by Daniel Kahneman, um, he, uh, she'll go into a little bit of this, but the best way to understand what we're talking about at the beginning is to like take a pause and watch her talk from go to 2019. It's excellent. It's not going to overlap with her talk for ETE much. Uh, and it's also just a lot of fun. Um, the thought here, and I'll kind of set up for the beginning of the interview, because I didn't really cover it well in the beginning is that the thesis of this person and his, uh, coworker or co-researcher, uh, is that the, the brain has two modes of thinking. It's got two systems. One's called system one. And so system one is kind of this intuitive, not conscious level brain is the one that gets the flash of insight, has instant access to all your memories and can instantly recall them. Um, and it's the one where you're, you're in the shower or you're sitting down, or you're taking a walk, you come back and you sit down. That's the answer. That's that part of the brain. You can't control it. <laughs> you can't tell it what to do but it's always processing things. Uh, and then system two is the brain that's the conscious brain. Uh, and system two is the one that we consciously solve problems with. Uh, and so the reason I'm bringing this up is we talk about this a lot in the beginning of, the, of this particular interview. Uh, and so when you see the interview, you might be saying, what's system one and system two? Well, now you know that it's based on thinking fast and slow, and it's based on the asynchronous uh, primal brain that has all the access to memory and has lots of judgments on things and quick answers for things that it's got lots of biases that are sometimes wrong, um, frequently wrong, but it can give you quick answers. And then there's the other part of the brain, which is the one you're thinking about. It can do one thing at a time, period. It can solve one problem at a time. Uh, and uh, it's a really fascinating book. 
And that's where we start the interview. But Linda Rising, uh, again, has a topic. Let me bring up her ETE talk real quick. Um, I think she's fascinating. She's so much fun to talk to. Mm -hmm. uh, her talk is about trees, agility, and me. I'll let her cover what the talk is about. Uh, but if you're going to uh, attend ETE and you like learning how people think and solve problems and how those things might go off the rails based on thinking uh, from you know different perspectives where you might have some biases involved, uh, that's just a little bit of what, what she is about, about educating people. So, okay, Miles, you can play the video and we'll catch you on the other side. I was watching some of your, your talks to kind of get re-caught up with your, uh, your speaking style and what you talk about. And I was watching the go-to talk from 2019, which I think is just fantastic, um, on thinking uh, fast and slow. And I'm sure that's one of your most popular talks because everyone can relate to you know, the, the biases that your intuitive thinking comes into. And um, I wanted to share with you a little bit just because I thought it was funny so I've, I've been a musician all of my life. And so oh, I find a lot of, yeah, what do you play? Ah, oh, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are a recordist, a recorder player. This is a tenor. Uh-huh. This is a tenor. So most people who have seen a recorder only know the soprano. Yeah, mm-hmm. And it's usually so, plastic. Whole family, whole family. And we oh. have a little orchestra in our community. So we teach people one of the instruments. And then we, we're just getting ready for uh, Irving Berlin concert. We just did gay 90s. Of course, we do one at Christmas. And so in our orchestra, we can do anything. We don't have to play the early Baroque, late Renaissance music that you know, this was a real instrument in the day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what most people who play recorder feel you should be doing is music from that period. So it's not that we don't because we do, but we also do. We can do anything. We did Put the Beatles, Beatles on concert. that thing. Yeah, I was just going to say. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we both said Beatles, I think. Um, Beatles. There we yeah. go. Cool. So the reason I brought that up is because I think that you know, so so the thesis, at least that I caught from the thinking fast and slow conversation and what I should have read the book, as you had said, everyone buys it, doesn't read it. I'm in there, um, you know, but I think musicians really get this because we spend an inordinate amount of time getting good at our craft, playing like especially as a drummer. I was a drummer for many years before I switched to guitar. And uh, you sit there playing all the rudiments for drums and you're you're playing them consciously until you get to the point where you think, you know, it's muscle memory. Well, it's not muscle memory. It's the intuitive part of your brain, right? Yeah. But I find it's interesting because musicians, usually a lot of musicians make really good computer scientists. Yes. And it, it doesn't, it didn't make sense, right? It didn't make sense right away for me until I started thinking about the way people think. And it does make sense from the fact of that you've got the intuition coming from your system one brain, right? The, 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 so why don't we talk a little bit about that? I, I know you've got, uh, as your talk, I'm gonna see you're just before, I'm kind of all over the map here, so I apologize. But uh, your talk that you're gonna give uh, is called About Trees, Agility, and Me. So hopefully I'm not kind of impinging on any of the topics there. Well, it, everything I do is, is about thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and so yes, this is kind of a little bit remote, but mm -hmm. yeah. If, if you've ever been out, and, and that's what happens during the pandemic, we had to spend more time outside. Mm -hmm. Trees, trees really help your thinking process. Interesting, yeah. yeah. So, a lot but, of research. But in terms of like uh, the 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 pivot between like system one and system two, the different types of the brain, the intuitive, quick thinking, fast computing, um, asynchronous brain. And you're, I've got to work through a problem, logical brain. Um, it seems like software engineers use more of the intuitive part than they'd like to admit, right? Well, they do, but they don't do it 
in any kind of regulated process is only happens by accident. Yeah. That they try to override everything with system two. And so they overuse it. And even if you didn't read Kahneman's book, most people take away the wrong message, I think, from his research, which is system one is flawed. It's the one that has all the cognitive biases. So therefore you don't trust it. And you know, that's going to do things that maybe logically you wouldn't be happy about, but that's not what I got. What I got was, yeah, it is flawed, but it's where all our creativity, all our imagination, all mo everything that we remember in the way we remember it, it's all there. And then we don't take advantage of it. And that includes software people because they want to, you know, just one more compile. I, I, I've almost got this bug. All, all I need is just five more minutes and I'm done. When if they left it and went outside and talked to the trees, you know, in five minutes, they would have had it. Yeah. And they should have done that five hours earlier instead of sitting, focused, concentrating, overusing system two. It's so true because I find myself thinking to myself, I really should take a break now. Yeah, but you don't. No, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. And then finally when I do and I come back, I'm like, oh, it was a missing brace. One missing brace. Oh, it's the worst. So funny. So as a yeah. musician, you, you'll be familiar with this. Like as a musician, you get to the point where you just kind of know where things are. So you know you're you know enough of the scales and the notes and things and what you can do with them. And I remember when I was in my high school years, I was being taught by this really talented jazz drummer. And what he would do is he would sit down with me, we'd sit across from the practice pad from each other, and he would get me to start playing something. And so we're playing, and he would start asking me questions. How was your day? What'd you do today? Like what how you what's what are you listening to? And he would do this enough every single time to the point where I had to work really hard at like practicing so that when I came back, I didn't have to think. So we had this phrase of if you think you sink, which I really got a kick out of. And that's totally that. That's totally the you get get it yeah. to the subconscious part or the, the unconscious part of your brain. Yep, because system one can multitask. Mm -hmm. System one, once it understands anything or once you've practiced enough, that's that's how we drive. Mm -hmm. We don't consciously think about, all right, well, how do I get this thing going? And where, where's the turn signal? And well, where's the windshield? What We just do it. And we can do it while we're talking to somebody. So we're obviously multitasking. And that's why people have the illusion that they can multitask. And the only reason why they're able to do that is system one is performing some bit. That's why you can walk yeah, and also have a conversation because walking is not something that requires our system two. We just know how to do it. But in the beginning, babies, they have to think about it. Yeah, They're consciously aware of, all right, if I do this, I'll fall down. I better try something else. And so it takes a long time to move those conscious practiced moments into system one. But once you do, now you can do. And the amazing thing about system one is there seems to be no limit. It's amazing. It can handle so many activities. So why not hand it everything you can and stop using your system to save it for things where you don't have a choice. You have to do system two for that. It's interesting, like uh, you think about when you're teaching someone to drive, I taught my kids to drive. So far, two out of four, I'm getting to the girls next. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, I remember like, you can't really communicate well with a learning driver at all because no. they're so, no. you know, this is this, right? I'm gonna die, I'm gonna kill somebody. Well. You know? Or you can't communicate with an experienced driver in an emergency. Yes. So you're driving down the road me. and all of a sudden some a child runs out in front, all of a sudden conversation stops and you have yep. to turn off the music if you're listening to that. You say, no, I got to yep. think about what's going on here. And now system two takes over 
you can only do one thing. So that is, think about your driving. Which way should we go? Should we stop? Should we turn right? We don't want to hit the child. You know, so that, yeah, even things we know how to do unconsciously, if something happens so that we have to think about it. So yeah. another good example is a good way to get, if you're a sports player, you play tennis or golf or something, and, and you're with somebody and say they're, um, say a golf player and you say, wow, how is it that you do that initial drive? I look, you're just going yards and yards ahead of me. How do you do that? Do you put your shoulder down and then step forward? Or are you leaning back? Or And now they're gonna think about it and they're not gonna be as good. Because they're going to say, oh, see, how do I do that? Do I put my, ooh, do I shoulder? No, no, I'm not doing, wait, what am I doing here? And now you have just messed with their game. Yeah. Oh, my daughter told me a funny one like that. My youngest daughter, she said uh, what we do to people at school to mess with them. She was in middle school at the time, younger middle school. She said, you are thinking about your breathing. Don't worry, but you you're you be aware of your breathing. And then the person's like <laughs> <laughs> mess up the autonomic function. Yeah. yeah, don't think about an elephant. So exactly. That's a good way to get in the sort of in the way of something that you do know how to do. Yep. And and in fact the, the classic example of that is Tiger Woods, who revamped his golf game several times by saying, all right, I'm an expert, I'm a pro, I've been doing this for, you know, since I was two years old, but he wanted to do it better. And that meant he had to undo it. And that meant he had to think about it and break it down and say, ah, oh, I am putting my right shoulder forward. I don't wanna do that. So I need to practice pulling my right shoulder back. And now he had to sort of back up mm -hmm. and relearn that and undo old habits and most of us don't do that that is so hard to take something that we know how to do already and we've been doing it forever and to say you know i really could be better at whatever that is so that means i have to move it back into system two slow it down break it apart so that now i can really study it and then do it again practice again to get it back into system one. There are not many people who have the fortitude, the energy, the time, the desire to take something that's working well and say, I could be even better. And be a beginner for, for a while because you yes. really kind of make, you have to put yourself back into that, be, the old Zen mind, beginner's mind book. Yeah, there's mind, yeah. exactly. Uh, same and thing. It's, it's uncomfortable because once we've been an expert, that's why it's really hard in say in software to learn a new programming language, especially mm -hmm. if it's a new paradigm. Back in the day, in the 80s, no one will relate to this, but we were moving out of COBOL, C, Fortran, which are procedural languages, mm -hmm. into either ADA, third generation language, or C++, object-oriented language, and most I mean, there are exceptions. Most people could not do that. Yeah. I remember the same thing about client server. When client server was a big yeah. thing, when PC started getting smart yeah. and people were starting to program desktop programs, even, even Visual Basic and stuff like that. They they yeah. couldn't make the jump from a monolithic, I know how this whole system works because it's a system to breaking it into two systems and learning a brand new platform. Yeah. And, yeah, I think that's why I've always enjoyed doing software consulting because like I've never stuck in one mode for more than a, a little while. I have to keep paying attention to the new technologies and it's helped me, I think, be able to uh, absorb new things. Like I'm not, yeah. I'm fearless about learning new things. I know I'm going to feel dumb for a while, <laughs> you know, but uh, I think you kind of have to, you have, you have to go and you have to really make a lot of mistakes, break a lot of eggs to make an omelet kind of thing, you know? Yeah, and I, I think there are some people who have a, a talent for that or a knack for doing that. Or maybe once you've done it, then you realize, all right, this isn't going to kill me. 
okay, yeah. I'm going to have to back up. I won't be the expert anymore in C or Fortran. It, it's okay because yeah. I, after a while, I will be pretty good at this new thing and then I'll get even better. But a lot of people are afraid and it's threatening to their status, especially if they are really respected guru of some sort and everybody comes to them because they get stuck on some problem and they go, oh yeah, we'll just go talk to so-and-so because he's the guy who knows and it's hard to give that up. Yeah, Oh yeah, yeah it is. And like when you're doing, so so let me back all the way up because I know it kind of came in in media's res almost. We were like talking about a topic right away without really introducing it to talking too much about <laughs> your background. But you started out, I think you said you started out as a mathematician and went to computer science, which I think I could see the, the kind of leap there because it's like you're solving problems mathematically and now you've got computers to solve problems and you want to learn how to do that, right? That was, was that your impetus for going into computers? Well, wait, you, met, you missed a big step because I actually oh. started out as a chemist. Oh, even better. Let's start there. Now, my bachelor's degree is in chemistry. Okay. And I, I've always loved chemistry. And, mm. it, you know, I was born in 1942. So do the math. I just had a really bad birthday. Oh, my God. And <laughs> I always wanted a chemistry set and my family couldn't afford it. So I used mm -hmm. to go in the bathroom and I'd mix up stuff from the medicine cabinet <laughs> and I'd pretend that I had a lab. And anyways, I've always loved it. And anyway, I, I fell in love with chemistry and then in college, biochemistry. Because now you're talking about complicated modules, DNA at the time mm -hmm. had just been identified. So we know about this double helix. I loved it. But that was I really exciting time. Yeah, it was just awesome. And then I worked for a while in a biochemistry lab. And that's where I suddenly came up against the unfortunate. You'd think I would have realized it, that biochemistry is the chemistry of living organisms. Mm -hmm. And to really study, you have to kill. Yeah. A lot of dissection and things like that um, and testing on animals and oh yeah i i thought i could do that but i love animals and it was you know initially my job to go up to the fourth floor and oh. i pick out the you know like the little white rat and you put your hand in the cage <laughs> And of course, it's the friendliest one. Of course, it is. <laughs> Trust you. One who comes up to you, and now you've got it in your hand. Yeah. And, um, you know what's going to happen. You're going to put it in the cage, and you're going to. I after a while, I just I just couldn't do that. Understood. So I thought, well, I started taking courses, graduate courses, because I'd already had a lot of math. And I thought, I'm just going to kind of move away from this. This is not working. And I went back to school, got a degree in math, which I still love. And I taught math for a while at university and had trouble. I was going to get through my PhD. And I met a guy at a conference. His name is Jim Caristi. And I went up to him at this conference. I said, wow, you know, you have an unusual last name. Do you know about, there's a theorem called Caristi's theorem. Are you familiar with that? And he said, that's me. I, I am Caristi. And I go, oh my God, you are Caristi. And I said, wow, what are you doing now? You must be doing some amazing thing. And, and he said, well, he said, right now I'm at a particular university. I'm teaching COBOL. Ah. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, how terrible. <laughs> oh, my God. To go from, you know, my theorem yeah. to teaching COBOL. And he said, well, I don't know how far you are along on your research, but in mathematics, it takes you forever. And now you get onto this little corner of the world where nobody knows what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> and you and you spend your time out there and you write up some paper and nobody can even understand it. 
because they don't know that little corner of the world. And he said, in computer science, you can run into the little corners in the intro classes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're there. You're already yeah. there. Mm -hmm. and so I don't know. He got me thinking. I don't want to spend my time in a remote corner of, you know, my own little private world where nobody knows what the heck I'm doing. And they want a blackboard in a quiet room. Yeah, right. I, no, I don't, I don't <laughs> think so. I don't think so. So, yeah, I kind of made a major, another, yet another major. So I know about beginner's mind. <laughs> yeah, apparently. <laughs> So you, did oh, software yeah. engineering. so you did software engineering for, I'm assuming, oh, many years. And then you decided to, when did you, how did you run into the Agilists? Like, how did you step into that world? Oh, well, but the, the Agilists all, almost all came out of the patterns community. Mm -hmm. Bob Martin and Alistair Coburn, Kent Beck, Ward mm -hmm. Cunningham, Mike Beadle, Martin Fowler. Those are all patterns guys. Mm -hmm. So if you remember the patterns community that got started with the Gang of Four book, yep. is that is that too old for you? No, no, no. Okay. I know yeah. that one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and I still am. I still am a patterns fan. I'm still part of that community. That was an awesome, amazing group of people that I was privileged. I just, it was random luck. I just happened to fall into that whole domain of looking at not only the design patterns, but user interface patterns, customer interaction patterns, patterns for testing pattern. I mean, anything you want, mm -hmm. the whole world can, you know, that was the idea is we were going to cover the world with patterns that, you know, and of course it was a fool's errand really but there were so many good things that came out of that. And then Agile grew from the thinking of all of those people I just mentioned. And we all kind of evolved in that same direction. And the the whole thing, I, I think, with uh, your focus on kind of the behavioral or cognitive world and psychology and the way people think, um, you know, you've got a lot of really interesting things you focused on. So you were working on these patterns books specifically, uh, around, I guess, like what, like, wh what would you call fear? What's the fearless change stuff, right? Um, well, and, and also, the, the other thing, yeah, yeah. The other, the other thing you have to realize is when I started those, Mary Lynn Manns and I met at a conference and we both thought the same thing at the same time with, could there be patterns for how you get other people to use, and we thought in the beginning, just use the design patterns. Mm, patterns okay. for using, patterns for introducing patterns, pat patterns for some kind of influencing people to use patterns. And I thought at the time, since I had just finished my PhD in computer science, I thought these were gonna be technical. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anything about psychology. I'd had one psych course way back in the day because you had to have it and I didn't really enjoy it or like it or pay much attention to it because at the time psychology was not as scientific. Yes, they did experiments, but they didn't have fMRIs. They didn't have, for instance, this mindset of being a little more technical it was too mushy, I think, for me. But that came later. And along the way in writing Fearless Change, I thought, wait a minute, these are not technical. This is about people. If you want people to do something, it's not about how you phrase your argument or what bullet points you put in your logic or what is it that you're going to tell them? No, it's about understanding where are they? What are they worried about? What problems can you help them solve? 
everybody wants to know the same thing, which is what's in it for me. <laughs> well, to that point, um, one of the things you, you have is the do food pattern, right? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I love that one. Yes. So and it makes sense. It's my favorite. It's my favorite. And, and again, it took me a long time to come around <laughs> to that, but I saw it myself. And once you've had that experience of, well, how do we get this team that's not really working well? And I, I would like to have them start trying to learn these design patterns. Well, you say, hey, let's get together and I will bring some cookies. <laughs> uh, and we'll talk about, you know, I'll, I'll introduce the mediator, you know, and they go, uh, oh, mediator, I don't know about Have this cookie. Cookies. <laughs> cookies. Oh, yes, cookies. I knew people, in fact, they sat in my row, you know, in the little cubicle Warren where we were all working. <laughs> They would go investigate and they would not go to a meeting unless they knew they were going to have donuts. Or <laughs> yeah. And these are guys who are making so much money. And yeah, they are mostly guys. Mm. They're making so much money. They could go down to the cafeteria and buy as many of those chocolate chip cookies as they wanted, but that it was free. Right something about that and i it's never did really understand that mm -hmm. for a long time i thought this makes no sense that that would be influential but it is <laughs> it is it's so funny so, so some of them you know i was i think this was the the uh the patterns talk that you did I'm t i took notes on uh from 2020 maybe you were talking about some of these things and taking kind of so you're some of the, the things that you brought up. So one of them was about critics, right? We all deal with critics in the workplace where, you know, you, you, and it works on your imposter syndrome pretty hard. Like you're discussing something you're working on and you're still working it out. And someone says, that'll never work, you know? But sometimes if you don't listen to the critics, you're just going to barrel down a road and not have a clue about what you're doing. No. Yeah. yeah. There are so many, there are, are sort of a little, sub collection of sub pattern language, if you will, for dealing with resistance. Mm -hmm. And there isn't any single one of those patterns that has anything to do with arguing back. Mm -hmm. And that's what we all want to do. You know, somebody comes at us and says, oh, agile is a pile of garbage. It'll never work. We tried that before and it was a total failure. Get out of here. I don't want to even talk about it. And then we start arguing. We said, well, you don't really understand it. Let me explain it to you. <laughs> Let me tell you about it. Let me give you the reasons. Let me show the evidence. And, and they're not going to have it. There's nope. something in us that just cannot let that go. That's what we think the response should be is to pick up the sword and, you know, fight back. I'll show you, let me show you what I know and how stupid you are. You don't get this. I, I win. I yeah. understand it. Whereas yeah. you, you don't have a clue. That's our <laughs> approach. And we don't understand why that is so ineffective. <laughs> right. Well, we just had four years of that. So, you know, <laughs> the, the, the social media is like the worst part of the whole thing. It's like everyone is just yelling at everybody else in cyberspace. And I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, you think you, that, that people evolve to a certain point and then we're kind of right back to where we were in earlier times, arguing with each other and shouting in the wind, you know, yeah. so it's just built into us. Yep, I, I, I think so. I think, and, and the part that's built in seems to be that we think each of us, so I'm including myself in there, we think we are rational decision makers and that we decided to do anything that we have done in our lives because we did some sort of logical examination of whatever was going on and we looked at the reasons why we should go agile or not or move from chemistry to math we had some reasons 
And so we think we're rational. And so therefore, that must be how other people do it. And so we will help them in that process by giving them the reasons why they should come to the same conclusion that we did. When in reality, as we were talking about system one and system two, system one is the decider, hate to quote George Bush, but system <laughs> one is the decider and just, we have no idea, we have no clue how that decision was reached, but system two cannot let that go and will make up a nice story, set of reasons why that's called rationalization. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense. It has to make sense. And so we think that that's why we did it. When really, we have no clue. <laughs> and we never will. We never will. Yeah, your, your intuitive part of your brain goes, here, that's the answer. That's it. You believe that's this. It. This is right. Yes. That's right. You're going to go this way. You're going to marry that person. Huh. <laughs> You're going to go into chemistry. You're going to love Agile. You're going to find a you know, this community of patterns people and you're going to get so excited. You didn't decide that. <laughs> you didn't make any of those decisions. So as soon as we can, if we can just get a hold of that, then we got to realize this person we're talking to, the resistor, well, I have no idea how they got to where they are either. And the absolute best thing you can do is just be curious and ask questions and listen, don't argue. And in the middle of some of those conversations that I've had with people where I'm just, oh, interesting. So you say agile, well, wow, you, you mean you really tried it here? Oh my goodness, when was that? And, it, and now they know you're not gonna beat up on them, mm -hmm. push back. So they become a little more open and they stop pushing. And now you're really having a con. You are communicating. You're listening to each other. And sometimes right in the middle of that, they will say, you know, maybe I could try it. Yeah. As and you said, people time, just want to be heard. They, they want to be heard. Time, yeah. Every time that happens, I just, I just have to go, oh my God, how did that happen? <laughs> I, I just I just had a conversation with one of my neighbors who refuses to be vaccinated. I, I do live in Tennessee. Yeah. And I was just doing the same thing. We were just walking down the street. I said, Oh, well, you you think that's not a good thing? And yeah, oh, I'm just I'm afraid of this. And oh, that's terrible that you're afraid of that. Oh yeah, and I think maybe it's, you know, and I go, Oh, you really think that? Oh my goodness. And right in the middle of all this discussion, she just looked at me and said, you know, I think maybe I will get vaccinated. Oh, good for you for talking to them and listening to them. I didn't do anything. I know, but they I just want to talk anything. to somebody. You know, it's one of those things where you have to talk something out, right? I mean, you got her to talk it out. She just needed somebody yeah. to listen without calling her stupid, without claiming that she was responsible for the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Without saying that, you know, people in our community have died before yeah. the vaccine was here. They died. I live in a retirement community. There are old people here mm -hmm. and yeah. they died. She knows that. I didn't have to tell her that. Mm -hmm. I didn't hold her personally responsible for any of that. I just listened. And sometimes I say, I listened her into agreeing to get vaccinated. I mm -hmm. listened her. So I didn't argue her into that or convince her with facts. I just listened her into that. I like how you put that. So I'm very happy that you're back talking to us again. I enjoyed your talks in the last uh, two ETEs that you were at. Let's talk a little bit about what, what you're going to speak about. So what is your talk going to be? It's about trees. <laughs> we all love trees. 
this is not about how we can help the trees. You know, there are a lot of environmentalists and I admit it, I'm an environmentalist. This is not about how we can help the trees or climate change, or we want to save the planet. This is about how the trees help us. And if we realize how powerful that help could be, that we might do a better job of allowing the trees to make us better. So it's basically the story of what I learned during the pandemic in walking outside, which I typically don't do. I go to the gym. Mm -hmm. And when the pandemic hit, the gyms closed. And I thought, what am I going to do? And my husband and I realized we live in a community with miles and miles and miles of walking trails. That's why we moved here, but we never use them. Because mm. we always go to the gym, we thought. And this is a big mistake that a lot of people make who get wound up in technology. We thought working out, exercising means going to the gym. Walking, oh, that's okay. But is that real exercise? I mean, is that serious, real exercise? No. So we were snobs. <laughs> we were exercise elites. Mm. And we did not do ourselves a favor. So I don't want to give away. There are several punchlines in mm -hmm. the talk about things I learned. The title has to do with learning about trees and about agility and about myself. So I've got three punches in there that I thought, wow, I didn't know that. Wow, I didn't know that. Wow, I didn't know that. That had enormous impact on me personally and on what I can help. I mean, that's why I read Thinking Fast and Slow and uh, The Master and His Emissary, which I just finished, which is, oh my God, that was a slog. Oh, wow. <laughs> Try to find things that will help other people. Mm -hmm. So it's got some of that as well. That Look, I learned this. I think it helps. Maybe it will help you. Awesome. So there is the talk in a nutshell without giving away the, the three punch lines. Yes, please don't do that. <laughs> well, yeah. this yeah, this is great. I'm glad you're going to come back and speak. And uh, we're really looking forward to seeing your talk. Well, thank you for inviting me. And thanks for spending time with me today, Linda. It was my pleasure. Thank you Same. so much. All right. Well, that's our show for the week. Remember, uh, we are looking for more people to attend Emerging Technology for the Enterprise. Uh, Linda is a fantastic speaker. Do not miss her. She's very worthwhile. Um, remember, we've got the tech chat, all one word registration code for $25 off the conference. And just, I mean, just look at these speakers. It's fantastic topics we've got. We've got two straight days of three tracks. Just fantastic stuff. So again, tech chat, all one word. And of course, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't mention that Chariot is always looking for good people. We are looking for consultants. Uh, there's a whole set of open positions on our careers page on our website. Uh, and you can see we're looking for people uh, who are software engineers, senior software engineers, iOS and Android and data engineers, mm -hmm. uh, and front end engineers in React and Angular. So please, if you want to work for a company that enjoys things like this and talking about technology and, and learning the new things and seeing how they fit, you'd love to work here. Yeah. All right. And Becca, thanks so much for joining me today as my co-host. No, oh, it's always a blast. It is. I love when you're on. All right. We will see you guys in next week. All right. Bye. Okay.